where are we going in the future with this stuff? Clearly there's some demand there, clearly we're already playing with it and you know, it's coming along, but there's a lot to be done to kind of move it forward. And the first theme in that is something you've touched on already, Daniel, which is the whole question of skills. Mm -hmm. you know, the role of IT management is going to be very different in this environment to what it's been in the past. So what sort of skills should we be focusing on? What sort of training are these guys going to need to you know, really help deliver these things in an optimal fashion? My view on, on the skills that are going to be required to drive the cloud platforms, again, fundamentally, it's not the typical vendor-led Cisco, VMware, Citrix-style third-level engineering capability that's going to be needed to drive these environments. It's going to be, I guess, a, a component of operational awareness for the drivers because they're going to know they have a resource pool and how to prioritise and allocate it. The strategic shift I see in, in should I say, the CIO kind of mind space is that those resources can either be um, offloaded, to put it bluntly, or alternatively redeployed into what is the strategic elements of the business. So far, you know, insofar as the focusing on the application or transition to cloud services, etc. The skill set required for the provider, however, basically it all depends on the platforms on which they operate. So the end user, I guess in a nutshell, things will get a lot simpler, self-service, easier to drive, and the service provider will need to maintain the requisite skill set to drive their engines. Well, you're right on the bleeding edge of this stuff. How hard are you finding it to you know, get the right people and keep them trained up? Well, I guess I always, I've always had this notion, you can't hire blue fire people, we breed them. Not in test tubes, <laughs> as much as I'd like to, but it's because, you know, and even now when you, when you try and look for a cloud engineer, well, what is a cloud engineer? Is it an infrastructure person? Is it a person who can price in a service catalogue? Is it a software developer building SDKs for API interfaces into corporate apps? It's a mixture of all of them. If we look at the silos within Blue Fire today, where it used to be the project office, the sales guys, the engineering team, it's now a real mesh of it all. What is the product and service we are developing? What are the requisite pools of engineers and skills in the business we need to feed all up into the service creation? Because that's really what we're about today, creating maximum value through the services that we're bringing to market. What do you see happening in the near future for private cloud? What are the big changes and developments that you expect? We'll see less talk of private cloud over time, particularly private cloud mm. in terms of inside my own organisation. You know, it, it, that's, that's going to be kind of the micro-generation equivalent of power. You know, yeah, yeah, I'll have a couple of solar panels on the roof, but seriously, I'll get all of my stuff from Daniel um, because, you know, that's, that's the best price and he can generate it the, the, at the most economical um, kind of level. So in that regard, I think what we'll see is a move to trusted cloud. It'll be much more this, I'm actually going to get it from a service provider, less of the internal stuff. So are we approaching the point where yeah, private cloud is just going to be a synonym for enterprise capable. Is that really where we're getting to? I'd have to say yes. Yeah. I think you know. I think the the true test of something that is inherently the right way to go about something is that everyone just has this wake up moment and and goes, yep, we'll all do it that way. That makes sense, and then it becomes less of a topic. Service oriented architecture was a classic in that. You know, yeah. at, at some point we tipped over that point where people talked about SOA as it was some special thing, and just everybody just built services you know that was the way applications happen i think the same will happen we're not we're not far from that tipping point where we become the genuine utility okay. you know exactly people don't know who their power vendor is or where they get it they just know that their water's always hot and the oven always switches on and i think we're not far from that point now where people say i don't care what it is how i consume it i just know where to buy it this is life hacker and we're all about the advice so i guess the closing question has to be you know if there's a business that's really looking at doing this stuff now they're thinking about it hard what's the one crucial bit of advice you'd give them to make sure that they get the maximum value out of it i think the <laughs> first thing is recognize your own capability and realize that it may genuinely be a bridge too far to achieve an internal private cloud, in which case a trusted um, solution from the market is the way to go. But in making that leap, make sure you have actually taken a good look under the hood of that particular provider. So, um, you know, looking at all those service levels, uh, looking in detail at, you know, the, the kinds of solutions that you are going to get provisioned for your business problem, and not just assume that because someone's giving you a, um, a, a compute service at a nice per person or per hourly rate, that it really is a genuine cloud solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well look, it's a big topic and obviously we still can't scrape over everything, but I think we've done a reasonable job of you know, demystifying some of the core bits of private cloud. So thank you, Sam. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Phil. This has been Lifehacker Live, demystifying the private cloud. See you next time. Oh, thank you.